from God's holy word. You will remember just prior to what I'm going to read last week or in, in the book of Philippians verses 5 through 11, the Apostle Paul gives this amazing example of Jesus as a humble servant who came from his glory and made himself into nothing. And I'm saying that because the first word in today's scripture begins, therefore, because of what Christ did, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too, should be glad and rejoice with me. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. The title of today's sermon is Living in Contrast. And as, uh, as Dennis pointed out, this is part of a con, it's in, in its uh, context. It's written as part of what we've been speaking about with joy and humility. Paul has been speaking about the, to the Philippians about joy and humility and how to, how to live as Christ and that, that we have joy to live out our lives for his glory and we are to live lives fitting of the gospel and that our lives should be lived in a manner worthy of the gospel to stand firm in one's spirit unafraid and striving together in the gospel. And then chapter 2, he starts to take up, he speaks of, of treating others more highly than ourselves and to look to Christ, who gave us the supreme example of humility, emptying himself of what he had to trade it in for humility in humanity. And because of his humility, God has, has now honored him more than all. His name is above every other name, that there is none beside him, that all are subjected to him, his glory, and his glorious love. Wow. But there's more. There's more. Therefore, Paul says. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray as we go through your word today that we would understand all of how this joy and humility plays together in a practical way in our lives. I pray as we go through your word that you would show us, make your word live in our hearts today. We thank you for this word. If I say anything amiss, I pray that it would come to nothing quickly. And that if I miss something, that you would bring it up through your Holy Spirit to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Therefore, Paul says, Once I knew uh, someone who, uh, when he first knew of Christ's love, he, he first had that first taste of salvation, that he, he basked in the sweetness of knowing that he was saved, for he had been hiding from God, even running from God for years. And finally, God caught up to him. Uh, that that we, we remember that God is the seeker, right? That is, it's God that is, does the seeking. He's the one that reaches us. But after this, this man had taken in the full measure of that initial wave of excitement and that newness of life, a new question came to him that he had never considered before. And that new question was, 
Now what? Now what? I've been saved. Now what? And we need to remember as Christians that salvation isn't so much of a destination as much as it is a completion of something which demands a response in us. When we understand the depth of our sin and the pit from which we have come out of, from what we've been saved and rescued, we have to respond. For grace is free, and yet it exacts a deep toll to those who would pursue it. Let's say that another way. We do nothing to earn the grace of God, yet now understanding what we truly have in salvation, how could we possibly live without responding? Jesus asked someone who would be the more thankful, the one who was forgiven much or little? I think the answer is obvious. The one who was forgiven much. So we are saved as believers when we've asked the Lord into our heart. Praise God. But now what? How should we live in response of this and in light of the humility of Christ? Therefore, Paul says, and Paul is going to give us a few life lessons. He's going to first give us a basic structure of how to work out our salvation and then give us an example of what that looks like in the Christian life. So first of all, he gives us a structure for how we work out our salvation as Christians. And it's important to say the theological term for this is sanctification. Sanctify, to, sanctify means roughly to set apart or to make holy. And sanctification is this process of becoming more holy, more pure. And it is surely a process. It's, it's part of our spiritual go growth process as believers. It's not something that we really ever finish, but it's a constancy in our lives, something we must continue to work at, just as the Philippians did. Paul thought very highly of the Philippians. We've talked about that. And he applauded their spiritual uh, maturity, and yet he recognized what we all need to recognize, that we have to all work on this. We always will have to work on our sanctification. sanctification. And you know what? We don't fret over that. We don't worry about that, but we look forward to the privilege of attempting to work on that each day, for we do it by relying on the Lord. So let's go to verse 12. Verse 12, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He says several things in here. Here's where he starts to give us that structure. He says, first of all, we need to obey. Now, it's interesting that they, he's talking about the Philippians and that they have this pattern of obedience while Paul was with them. And he's saying you have to be even more careful to continue to do the same now that he's not with them. So they need to obey. But the second thing they need to do here is they need to work on it. They need to work out their salvation. This takes work. They don't work as if they're earning it, for God has already worked that for us. But they are to take an active part in the pursuit of what they can never fully earn. It's a bit of a mystery, but their hearts are not to be dormant. They're not to be sleeping, but provoked by God's grace to seek after their own sanctification with God's help. So first they must obey, and second, they got to work on it. The third part is they do it with fear and trembling. They do it with fear and trembling. When we, we put something like that in there, at first it doesn't quite make sense. Fear and trembling may perhaps sound a little bit strange when you talk about this, this constant theme of joy that he's been describing. But as Christians, we understand that God, we understand God in a way that the unbeliever doesn't fully grasp, can never fully grasp God in the way we do. We live in a reverence and in an awe of God, who he is, in his majesty. And that is a scary thing. But it's tempered by our understanding of his love and our awareness of his deep, deep love for each one of us. So we live in fear and trembling by understanding the earnestness of the pursuit, the earnestness 
of the seriousness of the task. So put simply, we take it seriously. Sanctification is not meant to be a weekend hobby. It's not something we pick at when we have time. It's meant to be a life pursuit, a life goal, not something for when we feel like it, but perhaps even more for when we don't feel like it. I think of an illustration of, of a, a top athlete, and he or she would, would work at it. When do they work at it? They work at it all the time. They don't just work at it when they feel like it. They work at it even when they don't feel like it, and that's why they become a top athlete. And likewise, we are to take our sanctification seriously and to put our hearts and our souls and oftentimes our backs into it as well. And it takes great patience. And we do so because, as verse 13 goes on to tell us, it is God working in us and through us. So we, one, obey. We, two, we work at it. And three, we take it seriously, just as we take God seriously in reverence. So Paul has given us a structure, a very practical theology of how and why we are to work at becoming sanctified. But perhaps, arguably, one of the things I love most about this passage, perhaps the most valuable part of this passage, is the real-life example, the practical example, of how this looks in our lives. And although by no means is, is Paul trying to provide a compendium or a comprehensive view of how we work out our salvation as Christians, he gives us something that we can both immediately and universally, is, it's both applicable to the Philippians and realistically always to Christians of eight, all ages as well. Verse 14, he says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Such a short command. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. It's not extended. It's not explained. You know what? I think that's because it doesn't need to be long or explained. We all know what he's saying, and we all immediately know how much work it is. Note that Paul doesn't say something along the lines of, uh, you know what, try and cut back on the griping just a bit. Or, you know what, it would really be better if you kept the complaining in moderation. No, he says in all things, and that's a tall order. And as I was putting this together, I was, I, when I was thinking of moderation, I was thinking of, of, of a, a commercial, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase it because I, don't, I have, couldn't find the actual commercial, but I'm reminded of a commercial where this person was told to order his hamburgers or whatever it was he was eating in moderation, to which the guy enthusiastically agreed. He says, I love moderation. I'm all about moderation, so long as there's a whole lot of it. And it's funny because moderation is distinctly different from everything. And here Paul tells us to do everything without grumbling, everything without complaint. So let's think for a different. What's the difference between grumbling and what's the difference between grumbling and complaining? Grumbling, I think it's fair to say grumbling is done some, something more done under our breath. It's, and complaining is more what we say to our neighbor. Grumbling is more kind of to ourselves. Complaining is more to someone else. Grumbling speaks more to uh, what we're thinking or what we feel in our heart, and complaining is how we're spreading that poison among others, around others, and around to the others in the church, to others in the community around us. And although they're closely related, they're distinctly different in a few ways. When we grumble, we complain to ourselves in our inner spirit. We don't like how something is or how we aren't recognized, or how a leader chooses something for us, or how we are treated, and so on and so forth. And underneath it is this distinct exaltation of what we deserve. I was driving along, um, I was driving along one time in Pennsylvania, and I saw this billboard, and it said, you deserve it. That was all it said. You deserve it. And it was, I think it was for a lawyer or something. that wanted to get you to sue, I don't know, something. But the point was, I was driving by there, I'm like, I'm looking at that, and I thought, you know what, that's really kind of strange. I'm like, at the same time, I thought, you know what, what's really, really strange is that 95% of the people drive past that and say, yeah, you're right, I do. Because we all feel like we deserve more than we get. 
And ironically, of course, is that when we think about what we really deserve, we're a little scared to think of the results. So when we feel that we, we hold up what we deserve, our grumbling sours our own joy. It sours our own joy. And here's the kicker. There's no payoff whatsoever. There is no good that comes from it at all. We don't, we don't get what we think we deserve or, or that we have the right to because we, we vastly overestimate our own worth to God or compared to our neighbors, and we've lost humility in the midst of it all. I like to think of grumbling as anti-humble because it's hard to be extremely humble and find something to grumble about. In fact, I put together a little thing. It says, if you continue to grumble, you haven't learned humble. And I'm going to say that again just because I think it sounds cool. If you continue to grumble, you haven't learned humble. All right, and I'll put that upon myself as well. Uh, myself as well. We have to all do that. When we grumble, we have to realize that we're not being humble. So grumbling sours our inner spirit, but complaining poisons relationships. Complaining is outward utterance. It doesn't just sour our own soul, but it destroys relationships with those around you and in the church. Complaining is an easy trap that we fall into because it often camouflages itself in many disguises. Sure, of course, it can manifest itself as gossip or rumor spreading or rumor mongering. That, those are easy to identify. Those are bad enough, and those probably are subject to a whole other sermon sometime, and they're easier to spot. But complaining is more crafty than that. Complaining disguises itself as truth-telling or feedback. It can even serve, or it, it can even seem to appear to serve to build relationships by commiserating with a buddy about something while it simultaneously tears down another person. And what's at the root of it? Generally, in my experience, a complainer spends so much time of their so much of their time recounting what he or she does not have or does not like that they have very little time to think about what they do have and how God wants them to use it. And God wants us to use what we have to build others, not tear them down. Once again, a humble heart goes a long way to reduce a cycle of complaining. But both grumbling and complaining are easy to do, and they can become habitual very quickly. And Paul is saying that we all need to be vigilant and actively working on both of them, and I think he's specifically talking about this. We are going to hit this in a few weeks. He's going to talk about this, that there's some of this stuff going on, even in a mature church. So we have to always be vigilant and actively working on on reducing these when in all things yikes that's hard pastor so how do we do it we do what paul has already told us one we obey two we work actively on it and three with fear and trembling we earnestly seek it in every aspect of our lives by taking it seriously but paul adds one more thing he adds a compelling reason, a compelling rationale for why we should do this in this passage. He tells us that we are to live this way as Christians in our humility, not to grumble, not to complain in anything that we do because we know that the Lord sees us, yes, but more pointedly because others are always watching us. In verse 14 and 15, do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. When you look up at a clear night sky, who here has had the chance to go out to a place that you can really see the sky? It's exciting. It's actually, I mean, no pun intended, eye-opening. It's, it's amazing to think how much there is out there. It's a little harder to see around here because we have so much ambient light. But if you've gone out to a place, uh, it's amazing to see. You know what? When you look out at a clear night sky, the stars only stand out partially because they're bright. That's really almost secondary 
to it. Yes, stars, I realize, that are very bright, but the time the light gets to it, so it's not very bright. The stars stand out. Why? They stand out because of the contrast. They're surrounded by dark void with no light. And in comparison, their light seems bright. If you've ever had the chance to go out to a secluded place and you've seen this, you, it's, it's even more striking. Once your eyes adjust and you can see, you can see the Milky Way, you can see everything. But the point is that the stars shine bright due to their contrast with the light. A, a, a contrast with their light with the void around them. There's large expanses between the lights and then they stand out because of that. Likewise, our lives as Christians are surrounded by darkness on all sides. I'd like to look at that picture. It's harder to see up there, but you look at that picture and you see those lights. And I almost like to imagine them as Christians. If you've ever seen, uh, what is it, uh, one of those, um, I forget the X-Men or something like that, where the, the person's trying to think of all these mutants worldwide. I know not everybody's watched that movie, but if you've seen that movie, it's like suddenly that he can recognize that this person is different. This person is different. This person is different amidst all the different people. So likewise, we are different. We are surrounded by darkness on all sides. And our lives are to stand out by contrast, brightly shining with our purity, our holiness, and our integrity. If we grumble and complain as the world does, it diminishes our light and our joy is gone. In fact, it's interesting that the darker the world is, the starker the contrast. As an aside, one of the things that people worry about when they see the dark world around them, people, some have posited, have, have put forth that perhaps as Christians we should withdraw from the world. And you've seen that over in history. History. <laughs> history. I'm dying up here. In history, that uh, you've seen people as entire groups pull away from society and they go, they be, go into uh, become a hermit or they go into a small enclave and they say, we need to get away from that for purity's sake. Well, it's interesting because that kind of misses the point a little bit because they're missing the point of the source of their light. Yes, the world around you can drag you down. Yes, it can darken your light. But you know what? That's a process of us trying to remember who the source of our light is. The source of our light is Jesus Christ, not the world around us, unless we let it drag us down. So here's a challenge for us. Live in contrast Live in contrast to the ways of the world. Live in contrast to the easy path. Live in contrast because they won't hear your words about your faith if your life is shouting another message. Live in contrast. And I was thinking of an illustration of a number of years ago, and I don't like to give illustrations of my own life that kind of hold myself up because that's, that's not the right thing. But there was an interesting situation. Although with, and it was a boss that I worked with, we had a very good relationship. His name was Scott, too, of all things. Uh, but we had a very good relationship. And although we never really were speaking directly of his faith or talking about faith in general, I found it interesting at one point in time when he was struggling in his life, that he had things going on in his life and he was worried about things, that he said to me, you know, I'm not sure about all this stuff or faith or what it means. You know what? But I, I'm kind of counting on you to help me out with that as I can't figure things out. I thought that was, it just took me by surprise because I hadn't been trying to witness to him. I hadn't been doing anything like that. In fact, I had seen somebody try to witness to him and that totally rebuffed him and turned him off. But it was interesting because evidently somehow in how I lived out my life, through the grace of God, he mildly and gently, just through how I lived life out, he knew where to go if he had questions. And likewise, we are to live in contrast. We should live lives so humbly that the world is drawn to the church because it is appealing, not simply because we want them to come. Live in contrast. And imagine for just a second what it would look like, a community, a church, a people that lived in such stark contrast with the evil of the world, with the darkness of the world, that people were drawn to it not so much by the, the affections, the outside. Not by what we wear or what type of music or what style of architecture we have here. Not by whether we're the popularity or the, the faddishness. Not fat-ishness. Fad-ishness. 
I don't know if that's a word. Okay. Not so much because of the winsomeness of the pastor or the lack thereof or whatever. Not because they want to hear messages that itching ears want to hear or that something's in their comfort zone or that it doesn't challenge them. That they aren't drawn to a church because of that. But a people that are rather drawn to a church that is all together because it has this inner light, this inner joy. It doesn't grumble. It doesn't complain. It just goes on living life for Christ. And how do we live in contrast? Paul's answer was that we obey. We work at it and we take it seriously, living with fear and trembling. So here's a challenge. Live in contrast and see God work through you and see what he has next for us. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, I pray that we will have an opportunity this week to live in contrast. Always a scary thing to pray for. But a wonderful opportunity for us to learn what it means to put this into action. Lord, I pray that this week we would live in contrast. That we wouldn't go away unaffected. We wouldn't go away saying, hmm, I really learned something today. But we actually put it into action. That we actually turn our lives over to you more and more. That we don't grumble. That we don't complain. We, we learn what it means to be humble by looking at Jesus Christ and realizing that if he can be humble when he was deserving of all things, then we who are not deserving of all things and probably deserve a few things that we haven't fully gotten, that we too can be humble. Lord, I pray that we would live in stark contrast with this world. In Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.